Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, thank you all for being with us this morning, this rainy morning. But that just means wonderful things are going to happen today. <laughs> so today, uh, our prayer is going to be... Oh, okay. You're here. Yes. Okay. Our prayer will be led by Deacon Amando uh, Boteo from Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. Deacon? Thank you, Mary, for having me. Thank you. Beautiful day, right? <laughs> yes. For ducks. <laughs> <laughs> For Let us come ducks. together and we praise God and we thank God for our city. We pray for our mayor, the council, and of course all of us who are here today. We pray for the uh, elderly in our family, for the young people that were here earlier, the nurses to be. So we pray. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, grant, us, grant your people your protection and grace. Give them health of mind and body, perfect love for one another, and make them always faithful to you. Lord Jesus, we rejoice that you are with us, our creator and our ruler. As we call upon your generosity, renew us, keep us always in your love. So together we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Praise God. Thank you, Mayor. For Thank you, Deacon. Thank you. Uh, and our Pledge of Allegiance will be led by me. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Okay, great. Hornets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go Hornets. <laughs> and go Islanders. <laughs> That's right, 1990. Accomplished in many fields. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ms. White, would you please call the roll? Mayor Pollock will have the present. Here. Council members Roland Barretta. Here. Gil Hernandez. Here. Michael Hunter. Here. Billy Lerma. Here. John Martinez. Ben Molina. Present. Mike Pesley. Here. Greg Smith. Here. City Manager Peter Zanoni. Present. City Attorney Miles Risley. Mayor and Council, a quorum of the Council and the required director officers are present to conduct the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Pollock. Um, <laughs> Mr. Zanoni, your comments and update on city operations. Yes, yeah, right. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, because uh, we have no council meeting next Tuesday, we have a couple of things in the city manager's report uh, that are timely. So we'll, uh, we'll get to them this morning. We may break for the citizen comments. But let me begin by a very important staff announcement. And so last week, I appointed Michael Rodriguez as the deputy city manager. It was effective on the 24th of, uh, of October. And just for the council's uh, understanding, we did send you a memo, but in, in the role of deputy city manager, Michael will serve as the interim city manager in my absence. Uh, this is an important part. He will work with governmental and private sectors, council member, uh, to strengthen our relationships. Um, with our partner governments and, and nonprofits and other sectors in our community. Uh, we know that we're the, the regional leader. Uh, we need to spend more time uh, building those relationships. So Michael will uh, be a key person in doing that. He'll continue to oversee workflow amongst the departments uh, by leading the executive team and, co and coordinating our goals that we have. And he'll continue to provide leadership to his departments, uh, most notably the public safety operations and, uh, and fire department, that includes our police and fire departments. He'll also continue to oversee human resources and parks and recreation in that innovation uh, unit that we have. So just as some background, Michael has over 10 years of local government experience working in an executive capacity for the city of Corpus Christi. Uh, for about three years, and previously he was in the city of San, actually over three years, but previously he was in the city of San Antonio. Uh, as we know, his last title here was chief of staff, and um, 
He led the same departments I just referenced that um, uh, for some time now. Uh, these departments have a combined budget of 273 million and uh, over 100, uh, 1,800 employees. So he's overseen a lot in the organization. Uh, he's had direct oversight over several major city initiatives in his time here, including the, the uh, creation of the engineering and public works operations, the separation of those two to create a separate public works department. Um, he's also worked with our libraries, communications, and governmental affairs as well. Michael was instrumental in the very successful 2020 bond program, the $75 million uh, program uh, that has a new business process of awarding all engineering contracts for our streets and some of our parks in a mass selection process. And what that has done is that it has allowed us to put all of our contracts or all of our projects, all of our street projects in design five months after the election, less than two years ago, which leads us to have more than half of those projects under construction today or construction contract awarded uh, by the end of this year. So Michael's also uh, been very instrumental in helping to build the team and his role as chief of staff and working closely with human resources. Uh, he helped me to recruit over 30 executives uh, to this organization. That's about half of all of our what we consider our top 65 executives. That includes helping to recruit the chief uh, uh, operating officer uh, for our water and wastewater, our chief financial officer, uh, the public works director, uh, and the human resources director. And uh, believe it or not, was Chief Markle. He was instrumental in helping get Chief Markle back here. Uh, so <laughs> that alone is, is a good deal. <laughs> So uh, Michael's also been very instrumental in what a lot of employees have thanked us for, and that is having a much better health care plan. Uh, that's one of the uh, first things employees told me when I got here three and a half years ago is that our health care plan uh, was less than optimal and was really a catastrophic plan. And that's a very important benefit for any organization. So he helped to create the new consumer-driven health care plan, which not only saves employees money, but it's saving taxpayers significant dollars and providing a great insurance program. So in terms of his educational background, he has a bachelor's of science and a master's of public administration from University of Texas in San Antonio. He's completed a Bloomberg Harvard executive leadership in crisis management, and he's currently enrolled in a, a Bloomberg leadership program for economic development. Uh, Michael wants to share a few words uh, with you all this morning, even though he's no stranger to people here. So I'm gonna turn it over to him for a few minutes. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm very excited to be selected as Deputy City Manager. Um, over my past three and a half years here, our team has accomplished a lot of great goals and we've been doing, making progress towards undoing decades of neglect, like Peter likes to say. And I'm really proud to be a part of that and I really look forward to working with the team. Um, all of this cannot be done without a team and we have a really great team with us. Uh, we have highly, highly trained professionals, technical experts, so I'm really looking forward to continue working with them, continue providing leadership and mentorship with, to them. Um, so again, I'm just really excited about it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Michael. Congratulations, thank you. Michael. Okay, we're going to uh, turn our attention to another very important topic, which is the United Way. And uh, we know uh, that uh, the United Way is a, is a great agency here that helps the underserved in our community. And uh, the city organization, like many organizations, contribute to uh, their uh, fundraising goals to support uh, agencies across uh, numerous counties here. And our agency is one of those, the city of Corpus Christi. So uh, we have a little over 4,000 employees and we're beginning our campaign to have them pledge dollars uh, to help those that are less fortunate than us as city employees. And so this is a four week uh, charitable campaign. It runs from November 7th through December 5th. So about four weeks of giving, you'll see banners up. Uh, there's there's uh, payroll deductions that one can participate in, but there's also fundraising events uh, and other ways to raise dollars to benefit the United Way. So. Uh, the city does partner with the United Way of the Coastal Bend to raise money for local nonprofit agencies in our Coastal Bend area. Um, these nonprofits are in Nueces County, San Patricio County, 
and eight surrounding counties. So there's a big, uh, a big reach that the United Way has. Uh, there is a total of 64 local nonprofit agencies that the United Way works with. And so there's somewhat of a vetting process to be, in a, non, uh, to be a sponsored agency of the United Way. Uh, you have to go through a vetting process. So they have 64. And so when an employee contributes their dollars, uh, they can pick which agency to give it to. These agencies focus on education, on health, and financial stability for individuals and families in those 10 counties. Uh, their goal is to increase high school graduation rates, uh, to increase the number of youth and adults uh, and to inc uh, in, in health to make them more healthy and increase the number of financially stable families as well. So just to talk about some numbers, when I first got here three and a half years ago, it was, this event or effort was really not much on our radar as city employees. And uh, as I described it to our executive team uh, in our recent meeting, it was somewhat of an abysmal uh, participation level and, and goals. So we changed that. And in 2020, we raised over 125,000, the city executives did, or all employees, I should say, with a 31% participation rate. That was 2020. In 2021, we surpassed, surpassed that with 141,000 last year, 32% employee participa participation rate. So $16,000 increase year over year. So uh, because of the, the economy, inflation, and, and the downturn, United Way and, and the committee that I have that's helping us with this suggested that we have a goal of 130000 which is less than that 141 uh, that we raised. But I, I just changed that a couple of 10, 15 minutes ago to 135000 is our goal. That's a little less than the 141, but uh, the goal would be to increase employee participation from 32% to 40%. And we are mindful that uh, in our budget, we had a 4% cost of living increase. And I think our employees are fortunate in how we've adjusted salaries in, uh, in recent years, as well as kept health care costs low. So we encourage all employees to participate to reach that goal of 135000 And um, Libby Averett, is she here, Libby? Yes. So Libby is, um, we all know Libby. Libby is the president and CEO of the United Way. And uh, uh, Libby has worked for more than five years in that capacity, and we know that she had a distinguished career at the College Times, 30 years, serving as the editor, and then most recently the publisher, right before retiring. That's right. right. So Libby's here to give us a few more words on the, on the United Way. I did want to just share one thing that she gave us recently. We, because of our contribution level, we are a cornerstone organization. Yes, we got a nice, right, so we're a cornerstone organization which is commendable. We weren't this before. And so I want to thank all employees for contributing. Uh, we know that we work closely with the community to improve quality of life, and we often touch those persons' lives that are uh, less fortunate than we are. And so this is a good way for our employees to give back and even help the community greater uh, through financial contributions. So Libby, I'm going to turn it over to you to share a few more words. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members, and many thanks to Peter Zanoni for his support of United Way over his tenure here. You heard the numbers. The, the giving has really increased with his leadership, and we're very appreciative of that. You know, what I always like to remind everybody is that we are a locally owned and operated nonprofit. Um, everything we raise here stays here in the Coastal Bend area. Uh, we operate very efficiently. About 88 cents of every dollar raised goes back into direct services and education. We're a very transparent organization. All of our financial information is available uh, for use. We've got a, a very high rating with Charity Navigator and um, honestly, my own personal reputation um, is sort of tied to this, so I, I try to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that the money is being used how we tell you it's going to be used. I have to thank, too, Chief Rocha, who I didn't see here yet, but he serves on our board of directors and has been a very wonderful addition to our board and, and holding me accountable and keeping us accountable to make sure we're doing what we say that we'll do. Uh, and you heard
heard Mr. Zanoni say too about our regional outreach. It is a 10 county area and every year we're able to help through those 60 nonprofits that we partner with more than 180,000 people a year. You all know, you've been here a long time, you know that the need is great here. Um, and it's, it's not just, I don't want you to think that we just think throwing money at a problem will fix the problem. We, we very specifically and strategically look for those programs and for those nonprofits who are helping people get out of what hopefully is a temporary situation. And we've certainly seen that in the last couple of years with COVID um, that, uh, you know, people who never expected to have to wait in line at the food bank uh, for a box of groceries, you know, found themselves in that situation. And, and with the economy not quite back where we want it to be yet, we've got some folks uh, who are still struggling a little bit. And our hope is just to provide some support to those programs that are just helping them get back on their feet, you know, helping them be productive members of society uh, and not just keep contr contributing to the problem. So. Uh, we can't do that without the thousands of donors we have in this community, and it's through organizations like the city here uh, that make it easy for your employees to give if they choose to. We are not a we're not a hard sell. We, we you know we're not twisting any arms, but we do want to make it easy for everybody to be a philanthropist at whatever level works for them if that's what they choose to do. And we want to give them a lot of choice in that as well. So just thank you so much for the opportunity and for recognizing the good work that we do. And I'm happy to answer any questions if y'all have them. Thank you, Libby. Yeah, thank you, Libby. <clears throat> yeah. So we thank the United Way. They, they help to, again, identify those agencies that can help. Their uh, overhead is also very low in a nonprofit. Uh, something between 15 to 20 percent is typical, but their overhead rate is about 12 percent meaning employees' contributions go more towards agencies and overhead. So, Libby, thank you for being here, and thank you for meeting with our executive team, and uh, we appreciate your guidance and leadership on this. So we did meet as a, uh, uh, the top 65 meet monthly, and in our meeting uh, last week, uh, Josh Crongley, our, our, um, our procurement, let me see if I have the right thing here. Yeah, our procurement director uh, presented to the team a brand new document that talks about our procurement processes. And uh, it's a pretty thick document. This is yeah. the first time uh, that we've had as an organization something so well organized. There may have been some loose documents in the past. I've asked for some, I've asked for something like this in the, in the three years I've been here. So with Josh's leadership uh, and his team's work, they put together a guide on our policies and procedures for procurement for the city. So we just had a pretty robust conversation last week with the city council, and I said, Josh, it's perfect timing. Uh, instead of just sending this via mail, let's uh, talk about it at the city manager's report. So Josh is going to give a quick overview of what this is. We did pass it out to you this morning. Yes. And uh, essentially, this is a written document that shows we do have policies and procedures for how we procure goods, services, and to include professional services. So Josh, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us a quick overview on it. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yes, as Peter stated, uh, sorry, Josh Cronley, uh, Assistant Director for Finance and Procurement. Uh, as Peter stated, you know, the, the procurement policy, uh, we never had a written document before. We never had anything that we could uh, share with council or even with the city manager. And so when, when Peter appointed me uh, in December of 2020, that was the first thing we started to get to was to go and analyze our processes and, and, and look for written policy, enhance that, and, and compile it. We then hired Weaver in uh, April of 2021, and uh, we presented Weaver with our policy, our written policy, and they provided some feedback, and I'll be briefing uh, council sometime in December on the Weaver study, just a 12-month look back since with that published study, uh, which we got in October of, uh, or I'm sorry, which I presented to council in December of 2021. And, uh, and so today I just kind of wanted to provide you guys the, what I'm calling the user guide, a desktop reference for all city employees on the procurement policy. Uh, you know, I think there's oftentimes some uh, confusion on where the breakdown on some of these things occurs. And so I wanted to make sure everybody has a copy and can understand clearly where the responsibilities are and who, who does what. Um, the finance and procurement uh, department, basically, we're the central authority for all the uh, procurement guidelines, education, and citywide contract development. 
Our mission is to increase value and reduce risks by having department officials, employees, suppliers, all come together to work uh, in an acquisition process that is fair, transparent, and effective. The book you guys have before yourselves now is, uh, as I said before, the first ever edition of a policy and procedure manual. Um, it will provide information on, on all activities related to procurement. So if there's a question about how local preference is applied or a question about um, scope development, all of that can be found in the manual. And uh, this isn't a replacement for our governing policies and procedures. I think it is important to note that uh, we will update this annually or as laws or practices change. So, uh, um, but what we have here reflects today's best practices and methods. And it's, uh, it, you know, it's highlighted in a transparent document that we can share with anyone. The book itself focuses uh, on the procurement cycle, which we've broken down uh, into five steps. We have our procurement planning step, arguably the most important. Uh, our, our procurement determinate, our method determination. We have vendor selection, the actual contract development and award, and then the contract management portion. Procurement planning consists of departments performing a requirement analysis, market research, looking at different sources of available products or services that can meet that need, and then developing a scope that then they bring to my office and that we help form a solicitation around. So oftentimes, if we don't get an intended result, it means we probably didn't do as much pre-work as was necessary. In the method determination, this is where we decide any statutory requirements uh, or exemptions. This is where we do a cost analysis looking at price versus delivery times. This is where we take into consideration whether or not it's a high profile project, uh, whether or not the is something of, of urgent need for the department, and any other special requirements to be considered. This is where we decide whether or not we're going to issue a bid or whether we're going to do a proposal or a qualification. This is also where we determine the, the rubric or scoring criteria that we'll use in that solicitation. During vendor selection, this is where we do that administrative review, comparing against the minimum qualification criteria that we have. This is where we select committees who will then rank and score and I've provided guidelines in this book on all of these different pieces. So if you had a question on how we form the committees, you can read that. Uh, this is then where we'll rank and score them and come up with our recommendation, which will then move into the next step, which is contract development and award. And this is where we'll do negotiations, if permitted. We cannot uh, negotiate on a bid if there are multiple bidders. If there's a single bidder, we can. Um, this is where we'll form the contract. This is where we'll put in all the data, the milestones, deliverables. And this is also when we'll draft our agenda to bring forward to, to City Council. Uh, we also have uh, in, in the book protest procedures and any other element of the procurement process that Council may have questions about or, or want to ask about. Then it moves into contract management which is kind of the final piece before the cycle starts again. And this is where everybody will, uh, on paper, establish who the points of contact are for any of the contracts we're developing. This is where we'll put in quality control measures, checkpoints, again, against those milestones. And this is where we'll actually monitor the contract through the terms. And then, of course, logging and reporting, because if it isn't, writ if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And then this also addresses the, the payment section. So really on a high level, like I said, this book is providing you guys an overview of every level of that process. I thank you for your time and I stand by for questions. Uh, Councilman Barrera. <clears throat> hey Josh, first off, thank you. You really cleaned this up. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this hub program. Yes, sir. Um, so how, how, how did we determine that all solicitations of less than, uh, greater than 3,000, but equal to or less than uh, 50,000 is uh, that the, the solicitation required two hub vendors. So I have a good answer for you and it'll be in that book. So the, the book is kind of separated into two components. The first component is the application or practical application. So that is our procedure. The second section of the book is policy. 
And so if you were to go to that policy section, it'll actually cite um, the laws and ordinances governing it. Uh, but basically, to answer your question, Councilman, that is a, a state requirement that any purchase over $3,000 and under $50,000 has to have at least two hub searches uh, on, on a procurement. Okay, now, what I, I, I want to... I want to visit with you, and I don't think now is the time to do it, uh, because typically whenever, whenever there's a hub criteria, it usually has the requirement of a, uh, <clears throat> of a disparity studies to substantiate it. And um, I, 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 of course, I'm just, once again, just scamming, skinning through this right now, and I just went to the page that said hubs. So um, I think that's something that I'd want to discuss with you. Um, also, uh, typically, when there's a hub program, there's a set of goals attached to it, along with a disparity study to substantiate it. Now, I know there's talk at the legislature right now to be able to do a statewide hub uh, uh, to utilize the statewide program in regions, so that way we can adopt it instead of having to do our own disparity study. Um, so, and, and that's what we've chosen to do here: is adopt the states hub program okay. well that's that's as far as with regard to the goal setting okay I understand that you want to adopt their program uh, their their pro their criteria and their policies however typically when you have that then you have a goal attached to it and then you have a hub subcontracting plan attached to it so just looking at this from the surface I didn't see a hub subcontracting plan so um, I'm very obviously very interested in this I'd like to visit with you about it, and uh, what is it? And I appreciate all the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Smith. Like uh, Josh, is this available on the website? It is on our inner website right now. We're working on getting it published to our, our forward-facing side. I wanted you guys to get a copy of it okay. before you got calls about it. Well, well that's good, and, and I can't thank you enough for, you know, this is the kind of information we need. I'm looking at Libby in the office that spent 30 years on, on open information. And, you know, the procurement process can be complicated, and, and going through this 100-page or, or so on there, th thank you, thank all the staff for opening this process up, and, and so everybody is able to see a lot of the yeah. uh, rationale that we go through, so right. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Josh. So at this time, we're going to pause. I know I've got a couple of other lights on, but we're going to pause and go to public comment. It's 12 noon. Josh, if you'll just kind of, yeah, hold off there for a minute. Um, so, City Attorney Miles Risley, would you please go over the rules of decorum? Citizens are authorized and encouraged to present their views to Council on City-related matters. However, such should be done in a factual, precise presentation, and questions of Council or staff are inappropriate. Loud, boisterous, profane, or obscene language or behavior is not allowed. Thank you, Mr. Risley. So individuals will be called up in the order in which they signed up electronically. In-person public comment will be taken first, followed by virtual public comments. Corpus Christi residents will take precedence over non-residents. And for those commenting in person, I would like to remind everyone that a recording is being made of the meeting. Please speak into the microphone located at the podium. State your name and address before speaking uh, or before making your comments. There are two opportunities in which you can make public comment at any council meeting. Uh, the first one is at this time momentarily. The second is at the time that we actually hear the item on the agenda. So you must choose one. Uh, citizen comments are limited to three minutes. Non-resident comments, comments are limited to one minute. And for those commenting in person, there's a timer underneath the base of the microphone. It will let you know exactly how much time you have left to speak. Once your time is up, the buzzer will go off, at which time we would appreciate the conclusion. Um, of your remarks. If you have a petition or any information regarding your subject matter, if you will please give it to our city uh, secretary, Rebecca, prior to speaking, and she will distribute it to us. So with that, we will start with uh, Walter Miller. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Mayor Paul Eguardo and let me put on my glasses. Mm -hmm. 
distinguished council members. My name is Walter A. Miller, and I live at 3606 Marion Street in Corpus Christi, Texas, 78415. I am very proud citizen of Corpus Christi since 1965. Corpus Christi, two words, the body of Christ. One of my first mayors here in Corpus Christi was Je Judge Jack Blackman, and he said the city is city sons. So I take that as my permission and duty in reporting a harsh and very costly situation from my city that could have and should have been avoided this past weekend. A friend and I attended the Dia de los Muertos celebration downtown. A continuous event with lots of entertainment. The Day of the Dead. Well, of course, a day for partying. Traffic, traffic was diverted, diverted from Water Street because they wanted Chaparral Street to be a pedestrian way. Well, all through traffic was closed from Star to Schatzel. So I parked around Water Street, around the Vietnam restaurant, and walked over to Chaparral. When I parked and walked down to Chaparral, I passed several motorcycle uh, policemen there said hello to them, waved to them. They were enjoying the cool afternoon. They saw the parking all along Water Street, and they could have warned me or anyone else. Supposedly, there was no parking. When I parked there, there was a large orange sign, the diamond shape, that said, Detour Sign. When, oh, I'm sorry. Here, go ahead, you can go ahead and finish, sir. You can finish him. Was that after my car, I came back, after my car was towed, I went to one of these motorcycle policemen, and Sergeant Hummets called his captain, and my witness was with me, said she couldn't see any sign that said you shouldn't park. So the sh sergeant showed us on the sidewalk, five feet from the curb, sure enough, there were some signs. They were about 18 inches high, 12 foot wide, but all turned parallel to the curb, five feet from the curb on the sidewalk. So nobody coming along had a clue at all. Well, I parked the policeman right there. One of the same policemen later came when I asked him to, where was my car? The sergeant said, oh, well, it was towed. It was in the impound lot. It'll cost me $180 plus, 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 plus. So I asked to peek with his supervisor. When he told his captain this, and he explained our side of it, how the signs could not possibly be read, the captain said, well, go there and put the signs on the street. So that's what he did. He put the signs on the street, five feet from the curb, and turned them so they could be read, not parallel with the curb. 
I'm sorry if you don't understand this, but the captain asked that the signs be placed on the street and they were placed then five feet from the curb facing the traffic. He said, do you still want to speak to the captain? I said, no, you've been very kind and explained everything. Now, this is very important. I don't know if there's a way to pass it well, up there or not. What, what, Mr. Walter, I'm sorry, Mr. Miller, um, we can have someone, this body really wouldn't be the body to look at okay, that. Okay, pass well, it up there. That needs to be addressed, yeah. Anyway. The, the fines and costs were just out of sight, over $300. Right. Okay. And there were people stuck at the impound lot with babies. And the cab driver said, there are going to be some people that might lose their cars because they don't have a credit card like I do, like you do. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if they leave their car overnight, and sure enough, there were groups of people calling friends and family saying, can you help me? Okay. Okay. Mr. Miller, thank you. Thank you for, for making public comment today. I think your paperwork is right there behind you. Well, I'm I petitioning, and I have a witness to the whole incident, and so I also have a police sergeant. Right. Well, we've got plenty of police officers in this room today, <laughs> so we can certainly. Uh, who, who can talk with him, Chief Markle? Chief, Chief Blackman. Blackman. Okay, he's right back there, sir. Raise Blackman. Right. Yeah. But I wish to have Raise. relief of this, please. Okay. They'll be able to help you, sir. Thank you for coming. Uh, Doug Posey. Good morning, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. I appreciate y'all's time. Um, I'm here today, uh, m excuse me, my address is 14446 Northwest Boulevard, 78410. Um, I'm here today just um, really to, uh, to thank y'all for your, for your efforts. Um, this relates to item 22-3375, I believe it's the uh, Riverside Veterinary Clinic issue. And I just really, I know you guys have a lot of things that you go through. You have a lot of items, all of which you consider serious, but uh, I just want you to know at the local level, you really do affect people. Uh, you voted in unanimity uh, when you allowed me to prevent my, or present my, uh, my grade school explanation and my elementary school uh, illustration. And I just want you to know that it doesn't go without a lot of appreciation that y'all have the time and y'all have the patience to hear us out on every event. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Posey. Dustin Cronin. Yes, sir. Good, good evening, City Council and uh, Mayor Guajardo. Today I'm here to promote autism awareness, and um, uh, I just want everybody to know um, what my goals are and everything and what I plan to do around the community. and. Um, the first one on the top priority is educating our first responders and our public safety, which is our uh, police officers, our ambulance, our firemen, and our um, uh, judges, lawyers, and then also to try to get it on the driver's license around the county and, um, uh, I, and the city. And another thing I want to try and educate is churches and uh, schools and other local organizations like the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA and all that. And um, uh, autism, at the end of the day, it can make us a bit different, but we're all just regular people created by the same God. And um, uh, I, have, um, I was diagnosed at age three with it. And um, my son just got diagnosed about a month ago, and he's uh, two, and he'll be three in January. And um, uh, autism awareness. There is going to be also a walk in Austin, Texas, on uh, December third, and it'll be with uh, Autism Speaks. If any y'all, any of y'all would like to attend, it'll be at uh, Browning Hanger at Mueller Park. 
And um, uh, a lot of the most um, uh, characteristics of autism is um, uh, repeating sentences at the same time over and over or not reading body language or facial expressions or um, uh, not making eye contact and all that. And um, uh, so um, at the end of this, so um, uh, I am here to be the voice also for people who do not have a voice in our schools or around the, or around the city or the county. And, um, uh, and right here in this folder right here, I have um, uh, about 12 copies of my full agenda. But I know I know we're only limited to three minutes, and uh, I don't really have the I won't really have the whole time to go into all of it. And um, uh, if I know we've already met in public, some of you, and if you don't already have one, I got some right here to take it around. Thank you. And pass it around, and thank you for your service. And uh, God bless Nueces County. God bless Corpus Christi. God bless America. And um, God bless everybody in this room. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cronin. Thank you. Okay, well, that will conclude our public comment. Ms. Martha, we don't have anybody online? No, ma'am. Okay. All right, so we will go ahead and go back. Josh, um, we do have, uh, let's see, Councilman Hernandez, a question? Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I wish I had some time to review this before having to question it on it. Uh, Peter, if in the future, if you're going to do this, can you please give this ahead of time? Or? Uh, we did include it on the electronic. It uh, should have been attached to the uh, agenda that was sent out Friday, Councilman. Okay. We did include the electronic link. The, we uh, mm -hmm. I mean, but but we have, have plenty of time. Right we can in front of us here. Uh, it, it, just, it was one of those things where I was looking at it. In terms of some of the language you have here, and, I, and I'm referring back to the, the uh, procurement process we had questions about last week. In terms of it, you put it as a non-responsive. But you also have a lot of information here that is somewhat, you have a lot of mays and shoulds as opposed to will and musts. Uh, for example, to be a, a vendor selection responsible, depending on the nature of the solicitation, factors may be considered in determining responsibility of the respondent as opposed to will. Uh, well, it depends on the criteria we list out in that right. solicitation. And the criteria but. you have, determination is based but not limited to historical records, litiga litigation history, current performance, bonding capacity, reference checks, right? So on the, la the last one, it wasn't responsible, it was responsive. To be considered responsive only if, if response includes all requested information in the format required by solicitation. Each solicitation is draft drafted with minimum qualifications. These must be demonstrated by each respondent to be considered. Uh, during the, the review procurement, uh, um, during the review procurement, staff will score uh, on a pass/fail basis, uh, but we weren't given that pass/fail basis. This is under the minimum criteria, sir. This is what I talked about, which is the pre-screening. It doesn't say minimum criteria. Well, uh, it says minimum qualifications, but not minimum. Oh, I'm sorry. The minimum qualifications for a bid. The, so that's what's done pre. That, 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 that's the, the true, false, yes, no uh, at the top of every one of our uh, bid sheets where you, you, know, you, you have a communal row, you'll have the scores, but above that score you'll have a pass-fail. Uh, and so the, this is the minimum criteria, this is before we get to, uh, so this is like if we ask for five years worth of uh, relevant construction experience and somebody submits one year, this is where they would fail and they wouldn't make it into the scoring section. Right, so uh, in this particular case, it was just a, a mistake on an amount of, of, for a particular line item, which... Correct, uh, which is why we, we asked to deem it non-responsive because of lack of faith of the, of the bid. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll go through this with you, like Councilman uh, Barrera, on terms of some, Please. Of the, some of the language here. It, you know, it, it's nice, but I mean, you have very limited information on every section um, in terms of policy, like I said, may be considered but not limited to, right? So it, there could other factors could be considered. Correct, it's an operating guide, sir, right. and it's, it's my, my staff's job, which is uh, why we've started uh, in expanding the certification program, sir, to make sure they're educated and 
uh, able to, to help right. guide so, those determinations. So on the responsive one, on that last one, you, it's a pass-fail. So where is it unanimity that everybody scored them as failed? So the procurement officer, so the person conducting the procurement, makes the determination on the minimum so one criteria. Person, one person makes that determination? Based off of the criteria, yes. Established by, with aid of the department. You mean the minimum qualifications? Yes, sir. Minimum qualifications. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll... But I would say it's not, it's not one person in isolation. Certainly you work with the engineer of the city and others. Correct. And the, and the team, right. It's, re it's reviewed among staff, but right. I, right. it's not a committee decision. And ultimately, what I want to get at and why I push hard on this is because I want to make sure we have the fair process. And it's perceived as fair, okay? There's, whether we consider it fair or not, it's the perception out in the community and, uh, and, and the contractors or vendors that, that perceive us, right? Their perception is the reality. You know, there's other government entities in this city that don't have that, that have a perception that there's a, a, a thumb on the scale. I don't want to be like that, okay? So that's why I'm very a stickler on this type of stuff. And when we have things that are hard to explain, you need to have all the documentation, you need to have everything, your ducks in a row, so you don't have to be sitting up here uh, getting the fifth uh, degree of, of you know, of questioning if, you, you know, if, if it's, it's clear on the front side. So uh, I ask that whatever you do, because I mean, you know, I'm wondering if, if this company, uh, what is it, American Abatement, will ever come in and, and bid on anything again if they don't feel they got a fair shot. So I, I would recommend that you reach out to them and talk to them directly about what transpired and to encourage them to come back because this is, can, this can, I have a hard time with. Councilman, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna remind everybody, this is operational, number one. Number two, this is about being transparent. They are giving us the operational guide. You guys are welcome to go and call and ask questions about it. We don't, we don't create this guide. This is not what we do, we create policy. So we depend on you to do that. And you, this is great. This has never been. So this is a good, this is a good, right, a guide to policy and procedure. It's a guide to there who do that. We don't work upstairs. I understand and I always appreciate your comments and questions, Councilman, but this is what they are going by. This didn't even exist before. So this is a great step moving forward because anyone in this audience will be able to go read up on, oh, so how do they do that? How do they pick someone? But guess what? Not everyone who gets chosen or not is going to agree all the time. But there has to be a policy, there has to be a guide. That's what this is today. We're being made a part of this to share what this is. So everyone, you guys, I don't know how much time y'all have, but y'all go read this all weekend. And when you have questions about it, you can either meet with Josh, with Peter, with both of them, whomever, and, and we can get into the weeds of this, but I, I don't feel that we should do that today because today is about, Josh, you presenting this to us so that we do, lots of questions have arisen, and perception is everything. So Agreed. we appreciate that. That doesn't mean it can't be tweaked or a lot of what Councilman Gil uh, Hernandez uh, mentions isn't valid. It absolutely is. So I hope it's in there. I'm going to read this. It and is. And then I will get back because points have been made. Yes, sir. And and finally, I just want to say, like I, I said, the perception. Yeah. We want to make sure that it's applied uniformly, equally, sure. and you know, there's no thumb on the scale. Right. And, and that, no. it's not that's that's why we developed the the yes. guide, sir. So everybody yes. okay. will follow the same Perfect. instructions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hunter. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you said it was going to be available online. How 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 soon will it be available online? In the next month or the end of the year? Oh, yeah, before then. And yeah. I'll have, for example, when we have procurement, it refers to something like uh, this policy. Will it have hot links that we can just click on? It'll take us directly to the policy, or we're going to have to wait a while for that. No, it's fully navigate. It's fully awesome. navigable. The PDF, all the links work. Great. We'll make Thank sure you. we get it published. That's all I want to know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Those are all the questions, Josh. Great. Thank Thanks, you, Josh. Thank you, and again, Mayor, thank you. The, today was just an introduction. We could have just sent this via memo. 
but I wanted to explain it and make sure the council understood what That's it was. Great. So I appreciate the dialogue amongst the council members. Yes. And I appreciate Councilman Smith's acknowledging that this is about transparency. Absolutely. Right, and making sure we have defined processes in our business of running the city. Mm -hmm. So there's just a couple other things here as we close out the city manager's report. These are all good news items. Uh, there are four events taking place over the next two weekends, two events this weekend and two events next weekend. Okay, so uh, this weekend uh, we have the Greek Festival and also we have the Old Bayview Cemetery uh, reenactment celebration. So mm -hmm. this is the 59th Greek Festival of Corpus Christi and um, after two years of being somewhat absent because of COVID, uh, the Greek Festival of Corpus Christi is returning in person. The celebration begins this Friday, Saturday and Sunday. It is the 59th, uh, anniversary, uh, 59th uh, festival, as I mentioned. There'll be live music, dancing, some great Greek food, some wine, and uh, more at St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church. Recently, Mayor, you had the uh, priest, the lead priest, say the prayer. Mm -hmm. He's new to the church. Uh, this is the only Greek church in our city, but it's a very dynamic one. Constance is here, yeah. one of their devout parishioners. <laughs> she and, makes great uh, bread, yeah. I might add. <laughs> right. And the festival is free. Visitors can enjoy live music, performances. There are children's activities, uh, traditional dances, authentic Greek food, and those famous Greek pastries, Constance, right? <laughs> so yeah. uh, St. Nicholas Church is right downtown here in the Bluff on 502 South Chaparral. The festival hours are 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Friday, and then Saturday pretty much all day, noon to 9, and Sunday uh, noon to 5 on Sunday. So for more information, you can call the church at 361-883-9843, or you can visit their Facebook page. Their menu is on there and uh, very dynamic. I know I went my first year here, and it was a, a great event, and we encourage people to go again this year uh, since COVID is on the, down, the downward slide. And then also, to, uh, if you can split your time, there is a, another celebration at the city's Old, View, Old Bayview Cemetery. Uh, the, it's what they call the Old Bayview Cemetery um, Coming Alive event. It'll be Saturday, uh, November 5, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. That's at 1150 Ramirez Street. Uh, just as a reminder, this is a city cemetery. There are, there are over 600 individuals buried there in that cemetery. It's one of the highest points in our city in terms of a view. Uh, the cemetery was, in, it was inducted into the National Registrar for Historic Places by the National Park Service in October 21, 2020. So the Old Bayview Cemetery Texas is, uh, was Texas's first military cemetery founded in 1845 by Colonel Hitchcock during General Zachary Taylor's military encampment in Corpus Christi. And we know that Councilman Smith knows all of this, but I'm just reminding him this morning. <laughs> he can reenact yeah. and tell. And <laughs> right. Are you in yes. <laughs> we're, not, uh, we're preaching to the choir for him here. Yeah. But, um, but this is another event I went to also when uh, prior to COVID. It's really a neat event for children or adults. Uh, there's some uh, real authentic stuff taking place there. There's self-guided tours. There'll be live folk music, demonstration of the Frontier Battalions. Uh, there'll be storytelling and reenactments. There's QR codes that you can place, uh, that you can use uh, by each of the tombstones to see who is buried there. Uh, so we encourage people to come out. The event is hosted by the, what is known as the Friends of the Old Bayview Cemetery Association, uh, the Nueces County Historical Commission, Nueces County Commissioner's Court, the Corpus Christi Parks and Recreation Department who maintains the cemetery, and then the Corpus Christi Public Libraries and the Humanities of Texas as well. So two great events for this weekend. Then after the election next Tuesday, there's two other events the following weekend. So the first is a walk to end Alzheimer's. That is on Saturday, November 12th. It'll be at Water's Edge Park. And I know, Mayor, you had a ceremonial item for this walk earlier today. Mm -hmm. uh, the Alzheimer's Association Walk to End Alzheimer's is the world's largest event to fundraise mm -hmm. uh, for awareness in this terrible disease. Uh, the inspiring event calls on participants of all ages to uh, join against this fight of this, uh, this crippling disease. Uh, there's no registration fee for the walk. However, participants are asked to make a personal donation or to help uh, fundraise uh, as part of your walking. Uh, registration uh, for the walk starts at 8 a.m. and there's an opening ceremony at 9 a.m. next Saturday, not this Saturday, but next Saturday. 
and then the walk will begin at eight at nine thirty. So eight o'clock registration, some comments at nine o'clock, and the walk begins at nine thirty. I know several council members were there last year. Uh, we had some real good Starbucks coffee as well uh, to get us going. Mm -hmm. They said there's a video here. I haven't seen it yet, but we're going to roll this video real quick. We'll be showing it to our employees to get them out as well. And uh, let's see the video. Okay, so we're going to do a walk to get some equipment at right. some point here, right? Yes. Right. New equipment's on order. Yes. Uh, Moving along. Yeah, okay. And let me thank Pat Eldridge, who uh, her and I were some of the only few folks there during that first COVID years. And uh, we, thanks, uh, we thank the association, the group that helps with this, uh, this uh, important event. And then the final thing, Mayor, is also next Saturday, there's a walk to uh, help to end diabetes. Uh, that'll be at Texas A&M University next Saturday. It's a 5K. This one you register for and pay a fee uh, to uh, be part of the 5K, but those dollars go to this uh, effort to help minimize uh, diabetes. Uh, there's an estimated uh, one out of every three children born after 20, after 2000, I should say, one out of every three born in the United States will be affected by diabetes. So this is another terrible disease that we need to fight. Uh, Texans are increasingly feeling the effects of diabetes with over 2.8 million Texans suffering from this chronic disease. Uh, here in Nueces County, 14% of the population over the age of 20 has diabetes. And that's one of the reasons we hired Dr. Khan uh, and recreated our health district is to get better health outcomes to include addressing diabetes. So registering for the walk you can see here is at cctex.info forward slash 2022 diabetes 5K. Early registration is $25, on-site registration is $35, and the dollars will be used that are collected to benefit Texas A&M University's South Texas Diabetes Education Program that provides glucose monitor uh, meters, testing supplies, and health, health screenings as well. So those two events are next Saturday, and uh, the two I mentioned are this Saturday, including the Greek Festival and the Old Bayview Cemetery. So a lot happening, Mayor. I'm going to turn it back over to yes. you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank yeah. you, Peter. Okay, that will take us over to our consent agenda, items numbers 5 through tw Oh, I'm sorry. Councilman Pesley, yes. Sorry, just real quickly. Uh, Peter, uh, just a quick question. Several years ago, the, there was some discussion here at this council chambers about some funding that was provided for the old Bayview Cemetery or was right. possibly going to be provided. Do you, do you have any idea whatever we happened do. to that? Right. So the, uh, the late, uh, she's deceased now, but there was a nonprofit, the chair uh, of Anita that nonprofit. Eisenhower. Right. We put it, I think we had either twenty five or 50000 in our hotel occupancy tax dollars to do a master plan for the mm -hmm. cemetery. Okay. And I believe we began that work, and I'm not sure... Uh, let me find, I'll have to get a status report for you. Yeah, can we get yeah. an update on that? I mean, yeah. it's a uh, it's historically important uh, cemetery. Yeah. There are, you know, some of the founders of this city and right. uh, the people who are, who are buried there, and it received some vandalism several years ago, which has never been repaired. Mm -hmm. And the goal was, because uh, I worked closely with uh, Miss Eisenhower over the years in her role as chair of the New Aces County Historical Society, mm -hmm. But uh, the goal was to try to get uh, a restoration of some of those damaged headstones and whatnot uh, done. Right. So if you could get us an update, I would okay. appreciate it. No problem, Councilman. And, and secondly, um, with respect to Mr. Miller's comments, you know, when we're having these downtown events and we're all working very hard to try to encourage people to go downtown, let's make sure that traffic engineering is involved with whatever we're doing down there to make sure that we have parking and no parking areas delineated to where people don't have any confusion about where they can and cannot park. Uh, we don't want to make this into something that gets a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth because they get their car towed away because they were confused about where they weren't supposed to park. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and I've been down there on these events, too, and especially the one where they set up the barrels. You know, don't park between this barrel and that barrel, and it, after a while you get to go and, well, which barrel are they talking about? So yeah. we, we need to 
put our best foot forward on that. Okay, we got you. Well, yeah, and, and, and we do have to say that there's a great deal. Chief Parkwood, you can speak to that, but I, I don't know what occurred, but I do know that traffic engineering is extremely involved. Um, we want to lessen, good Lord, towing, that's for sure. Um, but Chief Parker, you can speak to that. Yeah, I appreciate that comment, um, Councilman. Uh, just so you know that these are comprehensive plans. They're made by traffic engineering. We, we work with them in, intensely to build plans based on pedestrian traffic, vehicle traffic, trying not to have a mix of both, trying not to have confusion of you know folks leaving their cars and then forced to drive their vehicles out of pedestrian areas where you know, now we have 30,000 people, which is about the normal number for you know, this event, 30 to 40,000 people. So it is a big effort. We, we put out signs, we put out um, public addresses. This uh, traffic engineering does too the day before. We take pictures of those signs. We inspect those signs. Traffic engineering inspects those signs. So, and it's done repeatedly year after year. Inevitably, one or two people will park somewhere, which draws more people to park there. You know, there's no parking anywhere, and they think it's their lucky day. Oh, look, there's a whole street full of empty parking spots, and it's, it, it happens. We have no, no problem reconciling tow fees. We want to make sure that we treat folks right. I wish we had taken this gentleman right to the impound yard and got his car out for him. Uh, we could have provided a little better service, in my opinion, at the, on the spot, and I'll address that. I'll address that. But we work hard to not inconvenience folks and maintain a very um, stable and safe environment for our, for the 30, 40,000 people on foot. Certainly don't want somebody getting in their car that's in the middle of that and then trying to make their way out. That's yeah, just no, I, that's I, just dangerous. And Chief, dangerous I appreciate scene. your efforts and, and the efforts of all your officers. I know you all work very hard to make this all work. and. As we grow our downtown, and we've all had the discussion, parking is oh, yeah. a big issue. And Huge, yes. Un until we get a uh, answer to that via a parking garage or w whatever we end up trying to do, it's going to continue to be a problem, and it's something we need to address sooner rather than later. But thank you very yes, much. Sir. But to your primary um, question, it is parks, traffic engineering, PD, any, anybody that has a, a hand in that, in that venue, is involved in decision making. It's a, it's a good effort, good. sir. Thank you, Chief Markle. Okay, so with that, uh, seconds and I could help on that. It wasn't uh, anything to do with the police. I understand. No, it was it was the the way in which the sign was the sitting. Signs were Correct. Out by someone else yes. The, okay. Yeah. So Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to go to our consent agenda items 5 through 20. Do we have any requests from the council to pull an item for individual consideration? Uh, 17 and 18. Item number 17, item number 18. Anyone else? Yes, Mayor, I need to pull the one. I, I lost the number for the uh, zoning request we had over adjacent to Donna Park. I want to pull that one, which are... I voted against it last time. I just wanted to make sure my no vote was carried forward. Uh, that's item number seven. Number, item number seven. Okay, is there any, anything else? Any other items? And do we have any requests from the public uh, for public comment <clears throat> on any items? Okay, there being none, I will entertain a motion to approve consent agenda with the exception of item number seven, 17, and 18. Move to approve. Second. There you go. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. Item number seven is case number 0922-02-HEP, Havelina Company, LLC. So uh, let's see. Yes, Councilman. Yeah, and, and Mayor, I just wanted to reiterate, uh, this is an item that I uh, was in opposition to I think this item should have been handled as a special permit uh, instead of a heavy industry zoning because once you zone it, uh, you know, I-3, it, it's no turning back. They're basically the world's the limit. And I just thought that a special permit was more appropriate for this particular project until we see how the, you know, whatever color hydrogen they're going to do here is, is going to be a success. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I would make that argument again. Okay. Well, I'll entertain a motion um, to approve item number seven. Motion to approve. Second. 
Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Aye. You mean no. <laughs> uh, motion carries. Item number 17 was pulled. That is a motion awarding a construction contract to A. Ortiz Construction and Paving uh, for the reconstruction of Strasburg Drive from Grenoble to Marseille. Good news item. It's great news item. <laughs> great news. And actually, it uh, looks like it's uh, contracted under budget. Yes. Right? By about 400000 That's correct. Okay. That's great so news. Say that again, Gil. It's a uh, contract. It, the bid is for under budget by $400,000. Uh, the bond project is a $2 million project, taking out consideration for engineering fees. It, we had $1.7 million, and uh, the bid came in at, what, $1.3 million? Well, it's 2.2 uh, it's is the total, but, uh, you know, it takes funding from the various sources for all the utilities and so yeah. forth, but it, it is under budget. 40000 for the engineering cut? Why don't I we mean, just keep going on uh, Strasburg then? <laughs> well, it, it goes to the end of Strasburg where it intersects with Marseille, correct? Correct. Well, kind of turn on Marseille. <laughs> well, the, the, the reason I was asking is because we went through this, we went, uh, the reason I brought this up and to point out that particular uh, issue is that uh, we had, um, uh, we went through the process and, and I have to thank um, uh, our finance department under uh, Constant Sanchez over there, uh, where we scrubbed some of the, uh, the old, uh, I guess, bond projects and use that money for residential streets. Uh, there's a, a, a street that intersects this is Grand Villars. Yeah, I believe it's going to be. I believe it's an RIMP. But if, but as these things come up, the, the that one is in really bad shape, and it's right there next to Strasburg. It, should, it you know, in spirit with the bond, it should be considered for that area. But uh, so I, I wanted to make sure that you know we identify those as we as they come up. That we do have some extra funding. That, and I, I'll I'll leave it. Open for now because you never know. You might have a change order. Yeah, un unfortunately, <laughs> they don't all come in under. So, I get it. I get it. But uh, just to put it on the radar that it should be something right there adjacent to Strasburg. Yeah. That's all. And I think we do do that, don't we? Do we do that or do we? Well, we just recently did it. But, yeah. yeah. Right. So this is part of the 2020 bond program, and um, so we'll have to let all those projects get completed because some, as Jeff just said, right. could come in over budget. Yeah, uh, legally you can't yeah. reapply it. You can't take on additional scope until you are assured that you can complete all of the scope that was part of the bond. No, I was right, talking so. about the streets around it. Like, yeah, no, and I, I get what he's saying. Now, you know, we will, if there's something like in an intersection or something that we yeah. could do that is logically part of the scope, it, right. you know, we, we look at that and that can be kind of change order. Sure. But, but you can't say, okay, let's keep this money right here around this street and right. add two or three others. No, you, you have to complete the project first correct right. so yeah, I, you have to com complete the proposition the proposition the entire proposition yes sir yeah okay great i'll entertain a motion uh, <laughs> mayor if i could this is a uh, important to point out to the community this is a 2020 bond program project 2020 bond and mm -hmm. it's less than two years before the ago that the voters approved this and the construction work starting soon so a good yeah, i believe uh, this December. is the third 2020 road project that we've awarded. Right. right. So it's, it's a good report right. card on the city's business of delivering bond programs, which right. wasn't always the case. So we're executing, we're getting projects done as the voters ask for when they vote yes. Yes. Good point. Thank you. So we have a motion. Motion to approve. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. And the last item pulled was item number 18. Item number 18 is a motion authorizing a professional services contract with Hanson Engineering to provide design bid and construction phase for Cefe Valenzuela landfill. Who pulled that one? Councilman Hernandez. Okay, in looking at this, I wanted to make sure, and this is more of a procurement process, so I asked Josh to come up here. The, um, looking at the numbers, I'm assuming your natural break was 60? Yes, sir. Okay, so you didn't do any interviews based on that? Oh, no, I'm sorry, sir. We didn't do any, we didn't elect that they needed to do interviews for, for this, sir. The, there was too much of a point gap for the 20 point difference wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have put anybody over the, uh, the okay, initial so, scores for. 
so I just want, you know, I don't have a problem with Hanson. I think they're a fine company and there's no issues there. I'm not familiar with the other companies. Uh, but, I, you know, this, this always leaves open to questions, right? And I want to make sure that we understand when you don't decide not to, when you decide not to do interviews or how did the points get so um, separated? There's no, you know, there's no information on that. So help us with the process. So if someone comes and asks me, how, how come I scored so low? Go talk to Josh. Basically all I can tell him, because I don't have any visibility to it. So. Well, and that's what they do, sir. That's where we ask them, that's where they can, they can do a debrief after, and I do them quite regularly, where a company says, why did I score so low? And we sit down and we go through their proposal and what they can do better, and we, we provide them the criteria, which is objective criteria, not the, the, the subjective score, the, the objective criteria, and say, well, you know, how can you better target that? And you, you have to remember, sometimes even though an, they may be an A firm or an A-level firm, they may assign their, their C-level team, and uh, depending on the amount of work and volume that they have. So even, you, you know, sometimes scores reflect that, where you may have a very reputable worldwide company who gave us their, their B team or their C team. And so, and we recognize that because we're looking at the teams and the individuals assigned on that team. Sometimes they bring in new talent that isn't tested in the water, and that can affect those scores. And so we're looking at it on a very holistic level, but it's, it's all based off of the objective criteria set. As opposed to somebody bringing, oh, let's say, somebody with a, with a, uh, a name, reputable name, and then somebody else does all the work? Do you catch that? Try to, yes, absolutely. That's, that's the exact point. Is we want to know how much work is being conducted by who. With the local preference certification, they actually have to provide additional information. So if somebody's trying to get local preference points under that guise, sir, we need to know what percentage of the workforce is being allocated from that local firm, and we're able to spot those much more clearly. This is an engineering contract, so this is governed by a statute. So I, I was just saying, in general, we can no, we can I get spot it. Those and, and this has been the, the the question. This is very subjective uh, process. And so, like I said, you got to be as, as clear as possible. And when you have disparities like this, it, you know, you got to give us some explanation on it. Because, I mean, no interviews were done, and the, the point total was so great. I mean, a 23-point differential uh, between that, between the one that got the, the, the bid and the, one, the second closest one. So. Correct. Interviews are supplemental, sir? Like well, the, I, the, I understand. The, okay. okay. I understand. It's just you got it. All right. It's we just, can add language to the procurement detail that maybe specifies why we when we don't be, be specific about it. We can always do, yeah. And so we put the agenda out a whole week in advance too. So there's uh, numerous opportunities to sit down with Josh. We'll be glad to do that, Councilman, for any council member. Yeah. yeah well, there's know. there's some and, and I mentioned that this morning. Sometimes I bring things up even though I know the answer to them oh, okay. because I think there needs to be some public visibility to it. It's okay. not always that. I'm not. I'm asking the question because I don't know. Okay. Right. So I see. I'll, I'll be okay, very no clear problem. about that. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Smith. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'm going to be more technical on this. And and I did call yesterday morning, but didn't get a call back. So um, uh, in in the packet it said uh, cell 3C is going to be at 130 feet. What does that mean, David? Is 3C? Uh, a capacity at 130 feet? No, sir. Uh, that is basically level with the existing landfill top that we have. But the top of the landfill will be a variable surface, and that just gives us a benchmark to give us an idea of where we are. We still have capacity above that. Okay. Uh, and, and the reason I'm asking, it, it doesn't uh, fall in line with um, your, you're not going to have uh, 2A in place till 24, right? That, that's so, right. So even though 3C is going to hit equivalent to the others on there, it's got capacity above and beyond. Definitely. We, we need to get this one completed before we're at capacity or we run into some major issues. Right. And uh, 2A, 2B, 2C, is that the 4.2 million ton capacity? Is that the total of the three cells, one cell? No, that's just the current cell. Okay, the, the okay. so that will be 2A itself. Right. And that will buy us how many years? Depending upon trash flow and how many hurricanes we have, it should get us about five years. Okay. And, and, and that goes to my second point. It's a little bit of concern for me. So uh, we're going to finance this through certificate of obligations, correct? It, it's what's in the packet. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, you know, I, I, I think financially, it's kind of like you buy a car that's going to last five years, and then we finance it for 20 uh, on there. So even though this is in the general fund and, and we don't uh, tag your capital cost to the uh, solid waste on there, it's just it's not a really good financial practice. Um, As a reminder, we... Uh we re recommended a fee increase in our solid waste operations in this budget, which was subsequently deleted. So we, we agree, Councilman, <laughs> pay as you go is much better. Yes. Uh, but we don't have the cash, so uh, yeah. this is a financing method to uh, pay mm -hmm. for it. Well, and, and I was supportive of the fee, but uh, for that reason, I, I think we ought to cover our cost. Uh, but again, financing a, a five year life over a 20 year period is. It, you know, right. That could be better practice. We agree. We okay. agree with that. Okay. So, uh, and then uh, another, so we have seven cells. This will be the eight cell out of 12 cells, a unit one. Is that correct? I believe so, yes, sir. And we started in 2008? Uh, 2007. 2007. I, I just, I can't get the numbers. So, you know, we've been operating 15 years, getting two years life for a cell. Uh, on there, but this cell will give us five years. Are we using them up quicker, or is there more capacity on the other cells to come in? Well, because we start on the perimeter of the landfill, the original or the beginning cells, if you will, are a lower elevation. As we come to the fill, the middle, uh, it gets higher. Okay. And so we have a higher capacity as we move towards the middle. Uh, it's just a height issue. Uh, mm -hmm. When you're working with the slope, the, the beginning of the slope is very short. As you get to the middle, to the higher ends of it, you have more capacity. No, it's, it's a peak deal. So you, you're starting the edge of the mountains and you're building up to the peak. Is that it? Well, that's part of it. We, you start at the edges and then as you build, uh, you get additional capacity, yeah. uh, additional height in the middle. And the, the end of it will be the highest peak of the, the mountain, if you will. Okay. And, and there's two units uh, in CEFA planned? Yes, sir. And this is unit one? Unit one. It's the smaller of the two. Okay. And when's it going to run out of capacity? Uh, 20, 25, something like that. Okay. Uh, with it. So we've got uh, capacity through. And the, in cells, unit one uh, till 2045, but okay. we have over 170 years of life okay. capacity now on the landfill. Yeah. So the land, the landfill's in good shape. You also have a, on the CIP a, a study to increase that number, combining unit one, unit two. Right. When the, when the landfill was first put together, there was a natural gas pipeline or an oil, a petroleum mm -hmm. pipeline that bisected the two units, unit one and unit two. But there was some unique language in the leasing of that, that if it was ever not utilized for a period of time, that that uh, right-of-way lease would revert back. We are currently exploring the possibility of recovering that right-of-way. The Petroleum pipeline has been removed, but there's a lot of legal issues that we're working through. If we can recover that right-of-way lease and then join the Unit 1 into Unit 2, it has a potential for adding an extra 100, 100 years life expectancy or even more to the landfill. So uh, okay. it's well worth pursuing. So, so we're only good to the year 2170 now. You're hoping to get to the year 2270. Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay. A, a little short-term planning here. Okay, okay. well, I, but I, I just want to re reinforce, though, that, that using 20 years, so, you know, we're seven to eight cells that uh, I hope as we go down the line that we're, we're more financially stout on this. You know, again, yeah. uh, a car, financing a car, five-year-old car on a 20-year note is not a, right. not a good thing. Yeah, time. good point, Councilman. Okay, but it... Yeah. <laughs> Can I, add, yeah. Yeah. can I add to it also, sure. our, br our brush diversion program, our composting will help to keep brush out of the landfill, which will further extend the life and financially help us all. So that's something we'll be bringing forward to the council. We had a policy conversation. We went back to give some additional options. So brush recycling and then even uh, plastics and other recycling all keeps material out of the landfill, which, which uh, keeps our investment uh, strong for the community. Yeah. Uh, in the landfill. Well, and I think one last comment, since since we've really got the landfill in the future, as far as what we're doing on there, we know we've got a landfill to stay. So long-term projects, um, it's, it's not like it's going to be gone tomorrow. No, sir. Thank you.
Okay, I think that's all the questions, Josh. Thank you. Motion to approve. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. The motion carries. <laughs> Excuse me. Item number 19 is a resolution directing the city's planning department to prepare a service plan for the annexation of county right of way for sections of county roads 18 and Mayor, 40. Mayor, we passed that on consent. Oh, did we? Mm -hmm. We just pulled. Um, oh, I'm 17, sorry. 18. Yeah, we pulled 17 and 18. Right. What time? Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Hey, Mayor, I'm sorry, but uh, since you did bring it up, if you don't mind, this is it. Just to highlight it, it's a good news item where a, a, a subdivision in, our, in the south part of the town uh, is trying to annex into the city, which is good. That'll. Um, That's why I was reading it. Right. <laughs> Councilman Pusley, we thank you for your leadership on yeah, this because this will help you. to bring like a. To a very nice neighborhood uh, in the city limits. This is this is great news. We yeah. we had originally turned this down, and right. the developers came back and asked me for their help, right, uh, or for my help. And uh, and the, the good news story is here. They wanted to be annexed. They right. want to be part of the city, and yeah. we worked very hard to find a solution. And right. so uh, this gives us that first step. Uh, and I think it'll be a good thing for the city of Corpus. And we so appreciate Peter, thank the, uh, you for all of your right. help. And Al and everybody, uh, they all work very hard to make this happen. So Al, thank mm -hmm. you all very much for your help. Yeah, thank you, Councilman. Councilman Smith? I, I just want to follow up on that. Councilman Pusley, I, I know how hard you worked. And now that we're so constrained for on annexations uh, with it, th th this is really big. If, if Councilman Pusley hadn't put this time and effort in there, we would have. 